Chapter 20 of Twelve Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Faithful to his word, the day before Christmas, just at nightfall, Bass came riding into the yard. How are you? said Epps, shaking him by the hand. Glad to see you. He would not have been very glad had he known the object of his errand. Quite well, quite well, answered Bass. Had some business out on the bayou and concluded to call and see you and stay overnight. Epps ordered one of the slaves to take charge of his horse, and with much talk and laughter they passed into the house together, not, however, until Bass had looked at me significantly, as much to say, keep dark, we understand each other. It was ten o'clock at night before the labours of the day were performed, when I entered the cabin. At that time Uncle Abram and Bob occupied it with me. I lay down upon my board and feigned I was asleep. When my companions had fallen into a profound slumber, I moved stealthily out of the door and watched and listened attentively for some sign or sound from Bass. There I stood until long after midnight, but nothing could be seen or heard. As I suspected, he dared not leave the house through fear of exciting the suspicion of some of the family. I judged correctly he would rise earlier than was his custom and take the opportunity of seeing me before Epps was up. Accordingly, I aroused Uncle Abram an hour sooner than usual and sent him into the house to build a fire, which at that season of the year is a part of Uncle Abram's duties. I also gave Bob a violent shake and asked him if he intended to sleep till noon, saying Master would be up before the mules were fed. He knew right well the consequence that would follow such an event and, jumping to his feet, was at the horse pasture in a twinkling. Presently, when both were gone, Bass slipped into the cabin. No letter yet, Platt, said he. The announcement fell upon my heart like lead. Oh, do write again, Master Bass, I cried. I will give you the names of a great many I know. Surely they are not all dead. Surely someone will pity me. No use, Bass replied. No use. I have made up my mind to that. I fear the Marksville postmaster will mistrust something. I have inquired so often at his office. Too uncertain. Too dangerous. Then it is all over, I exclaimed. Oh, my God, how can I end my days here? You're not going to end them here, he said, unless you die very soon. I've thought this matter all over and have come to a determination. There are more ways than one to manage this business, and a better and surer way than writing letters. I have a job or two on hand which can be completed by March or April. By that time I shall have a considerable sum of money, and then, Platt, I am going to Saratoga myself. I could scarcely credit my own senses as the words fell from his lips, but he assured me, in a manner that left no doubt of the sincerity of his intention, that if his life was spared until spring, he should certainly undertake the journey. I have lived in this region long enough, he continued, I may as well be in one place as another. For a long time I have been thinking of going back once more to the place where I was born. I'm tired of slavery as well as you. If I can succeed in getting you away from here, it will be a good act that I shall like to think of all my life. And I shall succeed, Platt. I'm bound to do it. Now, let me tell you what I want. Epps will be up soon, and it won't do to be caught here. Think of a great many men at Saratoga and Sandy Hill, and in that neighbourhood, who once knew you. I shall make excuse to come here again in the course of the winter, when I will write down their names. I will then know who to call on when I go north. Think of all you can. Cheer up. Don't be discouraged. I'm with you, life or death. Goodbye. God bless you. And saying this, he left the cabin quickly and entered the great house. It was Christmas morning, the happiest day in the whole year for the slave. That morning he need not hurry to the field with his gourd and cotton bag. Happiness sparkled in the eyes and overspread the countenances of all. The time of feasting and dancing had come. The cane and cotton fields were deserted. That day the clean dress was to be donned, the red ribbon displayed. There were to be reunions and joy and laughter and hurrying to and fro. It was to be a day of liberty among the children of slavery, wherefore they were happy and rejoiced. After breakfast, Epps and Bass sauntered about the yard, conversing upon the price of cotton and various other topics. Where do your niggers hold Christmas? Bass inquired. Platt's going to Tanner's today, his fiddle's in great demand. 
They want him at Marshall's Monday, and Miss Mary McCoy on the old Norwood plantation writes me a note that she wants him to play for her niggers Tuesday. He is rather a smart boy, ain't he? said Bass. Come here, Platt, he added, looking at me as I walked up to them, as if he had never thought before to take any special notice of me. Yes, replied Epps, taking hold of my arm and feeling it. There isn't a bad joint in him. There ain't a boy on the bayou worth more than he is. Perfectly sound and no bad tricks. Damn him, he isn't like other niggers. Doesn't look like him. Don't act like him. I was offered seventeen hundred dollars for him last week. And didn't take it, Bass inquired with an air of surprise. Take it? No. Devilish clear of it. Why, he's a regular genius. Can make a plough beam, wagon tongue, anything as well as you can. Marshall wanted to put up one of his niggers agin him and raffle for them, but I told him I'd see the devil have him first. I don't see anything remarkable about him, Bass observed. Why, just feel of him now, Epps rejoined. You don't see a boy very often put together any closer than he is. He's a thin-skinned cuss and won't bear as much whipping as some, but he's got the muscle in him and no mistake. Bass felt of me, turned me round and made a thorough examination. Epps all the while dwelling on my good points. But his visitor seemed to take but little interest finally in the subject, and consequently it was dropped. Bass soon departed, giving me another sly look of recognition and significance as he trotted out of the yard. When he was gone, I obtained a pass, and started for Tanner's. Not Peter Tanner's, of whom mention has previously been made, but a relative of his. I played during the day and most of the night, spending the next day, Sunday, in my cabin. Monday I crossed the bayou to Douglas Marshall's, all Epps slaves accompanying me, and on Tuesday went to the old Norwood place, which is the third plantation above Marshall's, on the same side of the water. The estate is now owned by Miss Mary McCoy, a lovely girl some twenty years of age. She is the beauty and the glory of bayou birth. She owns about a hundred working hands, besides a great many house servants, yard boys and young children. Her brother-in-law, who resides on the adjoining estate, is her general agent. She is beloved by all her slaves, and good reason indeed have they to be thankful that they have fallen into such gentle hands. Nowhere on the bayou are there such feasts, such merrymaking, as at young Madame McCoy's. Thither, more than to any other place, do the old and the young for miles around love to repair in the time of the Christmas holidays, for nowhere else can they find such delicious repasts, nowhere else can they hear a voice speaking to them so pleasantly. No one is so well beloved, no one fills so large a space in the hearts of a thousand slaves as young Madame McCoy, the orphan mistress of the old Norwood estate. On my arrival at her place, I found two or three hundred had assembled, the table was prepared in a long building, which she had erected expressly for her slaves to dance in. It was covered with every variety of food the country afforded, and was pronounced by general acclamation to be the rarest of dinners. Roast turkey, pig, chicken, duck, and all kinds of meat, baked, boiled and broiled, formed a line the whole length of the extended table, while the vacant spaces were filled with tarts, jellies and frosted cake, and pastry of many kinds. The young mistress walked around the table, smiling and saying a kind word to each one, and seemed to enjoy the scene exceedingly. When the dinner was over, the tables were removed to make room for the dancers. I tuned my violin and struck up a lively air. While some joined in a nimble reel, others patted and sang their simple but melodious songs, filling the great room with music mingled with the sound of human voices and the clatter of many feet. In the evening the mistress returned, and stood in the door a long time, looking at us. She was magnificently arrayed, her dark hair and eyes contrasted strongly with her clear and delicate complexion. Her form was slender but commanding, and her movement was a combination of unaffected dignity and grace. As she stood there, clad in her rich apparel, her face animated with pleasure, I thought I had never looked upon a human being half so beautiful. I dwell with delight upon the description of this fair and gentle lady, not only because she inspired me with emotions of gratitude and admiration, but because I would have the reader understand that all slave owners on Bayou Berth are not like Epps, or Tibbets, or Jim Burns. Occasionally can be found, rarely it may be indeed, a good man like William Ford, or an angel of kindness like young Mistress McCoy. Tuesday concluded the three holidays Epps yearly allowed us. 
on my way home wednesday morning while passing the plantation of william pierce that gentleman hailed me saying he had received a line from epps brought down by william varnell permitting him to detain me for the purpose of playing for his slaves that night it was the last time I was destined to witness a slave dance on the shores of Bayou Boeuf. The party at Pierce's continued their jollification until broad daylight, when I returned to my master's house, somewhat wearied with the loss of rest, but rejoicing in the possession of numerous bits and picayunes, which the whites, who were pleased with my musical performances, had contributed. On Saturday morning, for the first time in years, I overslept myself. I was frightened on coming out of the cabin to find the slaves were already in the field. They had preceded me some fifteen minutes. Leaving my dinner and water gourd, I hurried after them as fast as I could move. It was not yet sunrise, but Epps was on the piazza as I left the hut, and cried out to me that it was a pretty time of day to be getting up. By extra exertion, my row was up when he came out after breakfast. This, however, was no excuse for the offence of oversleeping. Bidding me strip and lie down, he gave me ten or fifteen lashes, at the conclusion of which he inquired if I thought, after that, I could get up some time in the morning. I expressed myself quite positively that I could, and, with back stinging with pain, went about my work. The following day, Sunday, my thoughts were upon Bass, and the probabilities and hopes which hung upon his action and determination. I considered the uncertainty of life, that if it should be the will of God that he should die, my prospect of deliverance, and all expectation of happiness in this world, would be wholly ended and destroyed. My sore back, perhaps, did not have a tendency to render me unusually cheerful. I felt downhearted and unhappy all day long, and when I laid down upon the hard board at night, my heart was oppressed with such a load of grief, it seemed that it must break. Monday morning, the 3rd of January, 1853, we were in the field betimes. It was a raw, cold morning, such as is unusual in that region. I was in advance, Uncle Abram next to me, behind him Bob, Patsy and Wiley, with our cotton bags about our necks. Epps happened, a rare thing indeed, to come out that morning without his whip. He swore in a manner that would shame a pirate that we were doing nothing. Bob ventured to say that his fingers were so numb with cold he couldn't pick fast. Epps cursed himself for not having brought his rawhide, and declared that when he came out again he would warm us well. Yes, he would make us all hotter than that fiery realm in which I am sometimes compelled to believe he will himself eventually reside. With these fervent expressions he left us. When out of hearing, we commenced talking to each other, saying how hard it was to be compelled to keep up our tasks with numb fingers, how unreasonable Master was, and speaking of him generally in no flattering terms. Our conversation was interrupted by a carriage passing rapidly towards the house. Looking up, we saw two men approaching us through the cotton field. Having now brought down this narrative to the last hour I was to spend on Bayou Berth, Having gotten through my last cotton-picking, and about to bid Master Epps farewell, I must beg the reader to go back with me to the month of August, to follow Bass's letter on its long journey to Saratoga, to learn the effect it produced, and that, while I was repining and despairing in the slave hut of Edwin Epps, through the friendship of Bass and the goodness of Providence, all things were working together for my deliverance. End of chapter 20